His name is synonymous with Singapore. After 31 years as Singapore's first Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew, at 87, remains politically active as the country's minister mentor. His supporters hail him for his piercing intelligence and his pragmatic, non-corrupt governing style. To his detractors, he is an authoritarian leader. What is undisputed is that in Singapore's 45 years of independence, MM Lee's abiding vision of a modern metropolis where people from different races, religions, and backgrounds live and work together has had a lasting influence on Singapore. As Singapore's success grows, so too does his legend. No one, strength, power. I have a few million people's lives to account for, and Singapore will survive. To give every family a stake in the country. In other words. That we should find a way to give them ownership of their own home, their own apartments. Then, if their sons have to go to war and fight, they are fighting for themselves. There will be no race riots in Singapore. That. This is an equal society. Each person has his own porcelain rice bowl, and if you break it, it's your bad luck. And they look after it when it is their own and is porcelain. We have to lock up people without trial, whether they are communists, whether they are language chauvinists or religious extremists. If you don't do that, the country would be in ruins today. The welfare, the survival of the people. Then, the democratic norms and processes, which from time to time we have to suspend. Whoever governs Singapore must have that iron in him. Or give it up. This is not a game of cards. This is your life and mine. I've spent a whole lifetime building this, and as long as I'm in charge, nobody is going to knock it down. Lee Kuan Yew is synonymous with Singapore. My parents would talk about him. You'd read about him in the newspapers. He seemed like a rather distant historical figure who was very important, very scary almost. He was kind of a mythological figure to me. I don't. I'm not a mythological figure. I don't know what they think of me or what. You know. In any way, it's not relevant. I'm no longer a central player in politics. Given Singapore's economic success, it is easy to forget the early struggles and hardships we went through post-independence to get to where we are. It is this collective amnesia that M. M. Lee wishes to combat. Now, what am I doing this for? Because you're going to write my views up, then I'm going to write at the end the way I would see it, and if I don't agree with you, I'll rebut it. That's that. That's for the record. I'm not here to to gloss over to burnish my record. No, I don't have to do this. But I want them to re- to know that these are hard truths. 
In 2008, the Straits Times was granted unprecedented access to the Minister Mentor, and between 2008 and 2009, a team of seven Straits Times journalists and editors met and challenged him with questions that had been gathered from the public, fans, and critics alike. We sought the views of more than 200 people, including many younger Singaporeans, on what are the questions that they would want to ask of MM if they had the chance. The result: a book of MM's views in his own words, distilled from 16 interviews spanning over 32 hours. Topics ranged from hard issues like political leadership, the economy, and Singapore's over-reliance on foreign labour, to personal observations on love. Family, homosexuality, and even feng shui. Well, I think the most important message in the book is that there are some realities facing Singapore that Singaporeans have to understand, and those realities, I think, will not change. The smallness of the place. We have only about you know four to five million people. Trying to make a living in, in a very competitive world, that we are in a neighbourhood that can be quite rough, and there are many of these hard truths no, that uh, I think new generations of Singaporeans have to learn and relearn, you know, as the older generation had. While、well, MM Lee readily agreed to the series of interviews, he did not always like the questions. Western perception, perhaps, of a lack of media freedom in Singapore, would make it difficult for Singapore to fulfil its ambitions as a global city. No,、talent. I don't think so. Rubbish. They say we are dull, sterile, no fun, no buzz. Now they are moving away from it. We are not going to quail under their sustained attacks. And if you quail, you are a fool. Say that, that sometimes we might have mistaken that we were asking questions for ourselves and not, you know, just posing to him questions that a lot of people may have asked、uh, about his policy. So there were times sometimes when we felt as though we were、uh, in the firing line. You're going to cross swords with me, then you must be willing to get stabbed. One thing's for certain. MM's character and worldview were forged in times when Singapore's future hung by a thread. It is that very tenacity and its unapologetic conviction in its beliefs that have propelled Singapore forward. Of course, sometimes what MM holds as hard home truths may be bitter medicine to others. We should grow as fast as we can sustain that growth. If we can make that growth, and you don't make that growth, then we are stupid. Let us consider the alternative. The alternative is slow growth. The disparity will still be there between the high end and the low end because it's globalization, and we are all poorer. I mean, he's as obsessed about Singapore as he was, I think, 50, 60 years ago. He's as obsessed about、uh, wanting Singapore to succeed. They stop sand. Abundance of sand everywhere. Why? As Malia says. Even the present size, they are a trouble. You you let them grow some more, there'll be more trouble. You got friendly neighbours. Grow up. And I remember very distinctly this part where he says, "You think we have friendly neighbours? Grow up." It's just quite dramatic when he. Tells you things like these. All the interviews kind of confirm my view that MM is a man who always speaks his mind. He doesn't censor himself ever. I think, <laughs> except in Singapore's interests. I think some people will also say that、uh, another factor is you know the fact that the PAP has very effectively and systematically demolished opposition. What political party helps an opposition to come into power? Why should we not demolish them before they get started? Once that... they get started, it's more difficult to demolish them. But there have been instances in the past, and then where you have felt that it was necessary to demolish the man. Well, yes, Jalan to begin with. 
cheese from one to another. That's right. I think they deserve to be demolished. I have no regrets. There was this this defiance about him. I think when we asked him about how he dealt with critics, you know, do you think he was, was he too harsh? Does he have any regrets? And you sort of want him to be a bit more, more magnanimous. But even to this age, you know, he can't let it go. That sort of added an, another layer to him. M. M. Lee's public persona may be that of a stern, iron-fisted leader, but that hard-edged image belies a softer side. Well, I am the one she recognizes most. I mean, <clears throat> uh, moment she hears my voice, she knows it's me. I mean, sixty, sixty-two years together. I mean. Which makes it more difficult, well, I think, for her and for me. But I've adjusted. But there'll be another adjustment when she finally isn't there. Then this big house will be empty. <laughs> so, but that's life, I mean. He's a politician, yes, but he's also a lover, a husband, a father, a grandfather. He opened up, quite frankly, about uh, his wife's condition, you know, the darkest moments of his family life, the happiest moments, what it was like in the Lee household. So that was quite moving for me to see firsthand. Many Singaporeans the Straits Times team spoke to were curious about M. M. Lee's life away from the public eye and about the Lees as a family. M. M. Lee gamely answered all personal questions. In your personal life, I mean, apart from your wives, mm. what has been the most trying and difficult period for you? I think when my son's wife died, uh, his whole framework collapsed. No wife, little baby. One Filipino maid. So mother-in-law and mother pitched in. My wife used to go there and help out, and I would take them out for walks around the Astana. The first year was very troubling. He was in a daze. If you think you married the girl and your children will be as bright as you are and as pretty as she is, you're going to be very disappointed in life. <laughs> You marry a person so that if the child is like her, you'll be happy. Whether son or girl like her, you'll be happy. And if it's like you, well, you cannot help it. <laughs> Please try to get somebody who will raise your standard, which was what I did. So you can see my three children, whether it's like her or like me, I claim no monopoly. So I told my children, and they bore that in mind. So the grandchildren, no trouble. I never hit them. No, I think my wife did most of the disciplining. She had a cane. Not used very often, but she has caned them. And they know that there are certain things you don't do. And I would support my wife that there's no, no uh, sort of bickering between the husband and wife. And then they say, oh, my father's right. I don't believe in love at first sight. I think it's a grave mistake. <laughs> You're attracted by physical characteristics and you regret it. Utter rubbish. <laughs> Utter rubbish. Look, I'm a pra pragmatic, practical fellow. I do not believe in horoscopes. I do not believe in feng shui. But and I don't, I'm not superstitious about numbers, but if you have a house which other people think is uh, disadvantaged feng shui in numbers, and when you buy it, you must consider that when you resell. Look, so I've told the cabinet when I'm dead, demolish it. I have seen other houses, Nehru's, Shakespeare, and it's a shambles after a while. People trot through and so on. And because of my house, the neighboring houses cannot build high. And I said, demolish my house and change the planning rules. Go up, my land value will go up.
You mentioned gay rights. I was just wondering, do you think, what is your personal view on being gay? Do you think it's a lifestyle? Or? No, it's not a lifestyle. You can uh, read the books you want, I mean, all the articles. You know that there's a genetic difference. They're born that way, and uh, that's that. I mean, so if two men or two women are that way, just leave them alone. After more than half a century in politics and in the public eye, it seems the things that drive M.M. Lee remain the same. His love for his family and his passion for his country. I guess my lasting impression is of someone who is very devastatingly intelligent, has a very abiding passion for Singapore, and who holds his beliefs so strongly that it can be shocking to some people. Before I embarked on this project, I had uh, mixed feelings about Singapore, having done national service, and, and I, I grew up abroad as well in Hong Kong. So I didn't always feel that I was rooted to Singapore. When MM talked about how Singapore is, is, you know, is a near miracle, people want to come to Singapore to live and to work and to have their families because they can feel, you know, whether they're of different races or religions or different cultures, that they can find a home here and belong. And I think that was very powerful uh, for me, that you know, we have these very basic but very crucial values. And I think, to me, that is something that is worth fighting for and is worth dying for. What are the things important to me in my life? My family and my country. I stand by my record. I did some sharp things to get things right. Maybe they disapprove of it. Too harsh. But a lot was at stake. At the end of the day, what have I got? Just a successful Singapore. What have I given up? My life.